Hi, I'm Michael Correa and this is Psych Exam Review. In this video, I want to explain the first box of our three box model of memory. And so this is the sensory memory store, or it's also known as the sensory register. Now the sensory memory store is a highly detailed representation of the sensory information that's coming in from all of our senses. And it's a very limited duration. It only lasts for about a second or so. Right. Now, as I said, this refers to information from all of our senses. So we can be more specific with sensory memory and we can talk about specific types of sensory memory. Um, so for instance, you could refer only to your visual sensory memory and that's known as iconic memory. So that's uh, visual. Or you could refer specifically to your auditory sensory memory and that's known as echoic memory. But for the most part, we're going to be referring to all of the senses at once when we talk about sensory memory. Okay, so why is sensory memory so limited? Why is it so short? I mean, less than a second, it's like it barely exists. So what, why is that? Well, it's sort of because of necessity. Uh, if you think about it, you have all of this information coming in from your senses and it's immediately being followed by more information coming in from your senses, right? It's this like onslaught of information. And so you can't hold on to all of it for very long. Right? You can imagine if you held on to all that sensory information, I mean, you'd quickly be overwhelmed with the amount of information that's coming in. Right? So um, it would be like setting a delay on a, on a guitar, right? if you ever used a delay pedal. Right? So you play a note and it rings out for a long time after you've played it. Well, if you set that delay really long and you keep playing notes, I mean, you end up with this just mishmash of sounds that doesn't sound particularly good. Um, and that would be sort of an analogy for what would happen if you held on to your sensory memory for an extended period of time. Right? You need to get rid of it because you've got more information coming in and that might be more relevant to you. So this brings us to a myth that you may have heard and I want to dispel this myth. Uh, and this is the idea that you have a detailed memory of all of your, uh, all of your experiences. That, that somehow your mind is able to keep a record of everything that's ever happened to you. And that if you could just find the right technique or use uh, hypnosis or something that you could somehow have access to all of this information. And that's simply not true. The information isn't there. It's not locked away in your mind somewhere. Um, it's, it's simply gone. Uh, it was in your sensory memory for about a second and then it was essentially discarded. Now uh, this makes sense because most of the information that's coming in is irrelevant. It doesn't matter to you. You don't need to recall it. There's no reason for your mind to keep track of all of this minutia and, and detail of everything you've ever seen or everything you've ever heard. I mean, you can imagine the amount of information that that, that would be. It would be, I mean, it's unfathomable, right? Uh, and, and why would you want to hold on to all of that, particularly if it's irrelevant? So uh, it doesn't really make sense that we would hold on to that information. And so uh, it's also, I mean, this hasn't been demonstrated. It, it's, uh, it's not the case that you can recall things. You might feel like you can recall them. And when we talk about hypnosis in the future, maybe we'll come back to this idea. You might think you remember some experience from your fourth birthday party that under hypnosis you remembered what color shirt your mom was wearing or something. But uh, if we compare that to any actual evidence, like we find a photograph from that party, we see that uh, a lot of times people think they remember it. It turns out they're wrong. So they're confident, but they're not accurate. Uh, anyway, so uh, that's a myth. Uh, hopefully you can forget about that idea. Um, all right, so let's go on to how do we prove that sensory memory exists? I mean, it's so short-lived. I mean, how do we even know that it's happening? Well, you have personal experience of something like this. Like, for instance, you see a flash of lightning during a thunderstorm. And you feel like, I mean, it's only there for less than a second. But you kind of have, for a brief moment, this detailed picture of exactly what it looked like. But within about a second, it's gone, right? Like, if you tried to draw it, by the time you went to write it down, you wouldn't remember it in that level of detail. So you have this feeling that it exists and the same thing with a sound that you hear. You can sort of replay it exactly in your mind as soon as you hear it, but a few seconds later it's gone. You don't remember exactly what it sounded like. So how do we demonstrate that it even exists beyond just sort of this feeling? Well, this brings us to some research by a guy named George Sperling. And Sperling designed a clever test to show that uh, this sensory memory did in fact exist. And the way that he did this was he used a device called a tachistoscope. And what this was, was uh, this was in 1960 before uh, modern computer development that would be probably how you would do this type of test now. 
Uh, but you would look through a little viewfinder and they'd flash letters on the screen very, very briefly, about a twentieth of a second. And Sperling would flash an array of letters. So 12 letters arranged into three rows, right? Four letters in each row. And they would be there very briefly, less than a second. And then he would ask people to tell him what was on the top row or the middle row or the bottom row. And he found that people were able to do this. They were able to recall one of the rows if he asked immediately. And so he, the way that he asked was by ringing a tone, a high tone, a middle tone, or a low tone. And ringing the tone a quarter of a second after they saw the letters. So very briefly, you see the letters and almost at the same time you hear this tone and you can sort of read the letters off of your mind. It's like they're there in your sensory memory. But what we're spilling found is if he waited just one second to ring that tone and, and ask for which row, within a second the letters were gone. People started making lots more mistakes. Right? He also found that people could recall when he asked within a quarter of a second, people could recall any of the rows, but they couldn't recall all of the rows because by the time they thought about one of the rows, the others essentially disappeared. So I can give you an idea of what this sort of felt like for the participants. Now I don't have the uh, timing set up to, to play a tone and we won't go through this whole procedure, but I'm just going to flash some letters on the screen and I'll immediately, as I flash them, I'll say either top, middle, or bottom and see if you can recall what was on that row. So uh, I'll, I'll try to do this, you know, the timing might not be perfect, uh, we'll see. So, top, okay, um, bottom, even then I, I've probably delayed it, it's probably longer than a quarter of a second there, and uh, top, All right, so you can see if you were, you might have had this experience that you were sort of reading it off of your mind, uh, off of your sensory memory, where you had this store of it, but if you didn't read it right away, it was gone. Right. And this brings us to the idea of selective attention. And that we can only attend to some of the things in our environment, some of the things that we see, some of the things that we hear, some of the things that we feel. You know, we can only attend to so much at once. Right? Our attention is by nature selective. We can't attend to everything. And so this means that in the next box that we look at, which is our short-term memory, we can only move some of the things from sensory memory to our short-term memory. There's no way to move all of them. There's simply too much information. I mean, it's, it's essentially infinite, the number of things that you could pay attention to. And so what you choose to attention, pay, what, you, what you choose to focus your attention on, what you deem as relevant, is the only things that you can essentially move to your short-term memory. And so that's the next box that we'll look at in the next video. I hope you found this helpful. If so, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. Thanks for watching.